Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com here. Here once again is in my garage shop. And in this episode, we're going to talk about dado blades and dado blade sets. And specifically, we're going to talk about their use on Shopsmith equipment. In my case, I'm using it on a Mark V Model 520. But the things we'll talk about today will be transferable to whatever version of the Shopsmith or even Total Shop that you might have in your shop. So as you can see, I do have a few dado blades and dado blade sets, and, and I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably just because I'm lazy. But <laughs> if we look at the earliest dado blade that I owned, it's this one right here. That's a carbide tipped blade that was sold by Shopsmith, made by uh, Vermont American. And you can see it's mounted on an arbor that mounts onto the spindle of the Mark V. And you've got these opposing wedges. And when we loosen the arbor nut and rotate that, um, we can set it for a variety of widths. So that's what those measurements there are supposed to represent. I say supposed to because it's kind of hit and miss. You, uh, you adjust it close, you make a cut, and then you adjust it again. Um, and this has been the way with adjustable wobble blades uh, as far back as anybody can remember. Um, in fact, the very first wobble dado blade that I've found in U.S. patents, the earliest adjustable wobble dado blade, was patented in 1882 by a guy named Joseph Cook. Uh, we're going to mount this on the Mark V, and, and I'll show you some interesting idiosyncrasies and, and help you get the best of those. Um, I have a variety of stackable dado sets here. Uh, I've owned this one, which is a uh, Freud or Frued, <laughs> if you're so inclined, safety dado, an eight inch dado blade set. I've had that one for probably close to 30 years. Um, I bought an eight inch replacement, which I've never used. I just, I had it because I wanted to be sure I had it handy in case this one would ever give up the ghost. Um, I have a six inch dado set also from Freud. Um, same story, I've never used it. Um, maybe we will do that in our midweek follow-up and I'll show you some of the advantages of that style of dado blade. But the focus of this video was going to be on these adjustable dado blades or wobble blades or one of my favorite uh, definitions that I saw in an old British woodworking book. They called them drunken saw blades. And I think that's a, that's a, a pretty good uh, analogy. Now, I mentioned the patent in 1882. Now in, in 1951, a gentleman named John Edgmond, who was working for the company Magnet Engineering, designed a brand new adjustable dado blade. And uh, by the way, if you don't remember, Magnet Engineering is the company that originated the Shopsmith family of tools. John Edgmond went on to also design, along with Hans Goldschmidt, the Mark V, the Shopsmith bandsaw, the Shopsmith jigsaw, the Shopsmith belt sander, and so on. I mean, the dude was prolific. And what's interesting about this blade, and this will answer a mystery that some Shopsmith owners have had. Have you noticed when you turn the speed dial up, if you have a uh, mid-90s and earlier Mark V, that just before you get to saw speed, you get to something called Magna Dado, but ladies and gentlemen, that's a Magna Dado. You can see it in the logo and you can see it right there as well. Magna was the company and the Magna Dado was the adjustable Dado that John Edgman came up with. So what you have with these wobble blades is you've got these two opposing wedges. And as those are rotated, it causes the blade to tilt off of its axis. So what John was trying to resolve was this challenge that all table saw owners had had. And that was when you put an adjustable dado blade on a table saw, if you're not talking a shopsmith where you can put, move the table off to the side, but if you're working through the table insert on a craftsman or a delta or whoever's table saw, and you're working through there with a couple wrenches trying to get things adjusted, it's a pain to adjust a wobble dado. And in fact, you can't see any of the markings on it if you're working down through the slot. And so what, what John came up with was the idea that, okay, you are going to loosen the nut that holds it in place. But then using a long tool, a tool which, by the way, is the first thing you lose when you have a Magna Dado, <laughs> with either a square drive or an Allen key, 
you're going to adjust this. Now, this one is designed to use a square. Uh, the Allen key version did exist. I don't know uh, in what order, but in the US patent, it refers to an Allen key. But um, it just so happens that a number one square drive or Robertson drive fits this perfectly. And you can see if we put this in here and rotate it, maybe you can see this, it'll begin to throw that blade off of its axis. So I can make that adjustment through the table insert of any table saw. I can look down through the slot also, and I can see the markings. Now here's the problem. The markings are not measurements, but instead they are letters. And uh, so what do the letters correlate to? Well, it all depends. It depends upon whether your blade's ever been sharpened. <laughs> and so uh, what, what John figured is you're going to want to take a piece of scrap wood, make a test cut, and uh, you can make a mark on that scrap indicating, okay, this is at setting A, this is a cut made at setting B, and so on. And you can make a little gauge to hang in your shop to help you use your Magna Dado. Now, the thing about the Magna Dado is if you look at the diameter of this, it is larger than the six inch Dado that is commonly sold today for use on the Mark V. Now, if you're going to use a large diameter Dado blade, you cannot run it at saw speed. You slow the speed down. Now, part of that is because it's got so many teeth and such a large diameter, it doesn't need to be run at the higher speed, but also at lower speeds, we get more torque. And so running it a bit slower than standard table saw speed gives you just that. If you're going to run a six inch blade, which is what's typically used by DIYers these days, you run this at table saw speed. Uh, if at any point you're dadoing, cutting a groove a rabbit and you feel like it's bogging down, you will actually be able to in increase the speed by slowing the speed dial down just a bit. So for the moment, let me point out that we are unplugged. I'm also going to put this blade arbor on here without the lower saw guard. I will never run a saw blade or a dado blade without lower saw guard in place. So um, what we're going to see now is an example that you should never, ever duplicate. So to use a dado blade, it does require a special arbor. This is referred to as the Molder Dado Arbor. It is still manufactured by Shopsmith. And it goes onto the spindle and locks onto the tapered flat. That set screw should align with that set screw that's on that ring. So to make an adjustment to install the dado blade, I like using the Shopsmith uh, Arbor Wrench. This is something that has been around again for about 20 years. You can buy these from Shopsmith. I really love this tool, but boy, are they proud of it. But you can use this to, uh, to tighten, loosen the, uh, the nuts on your saw arbor, your shaper arbor, and your molder dado head. Additionally, um, if you have an adjustable wrench or you have a set of, of uh, open end wrenches, you can use those here as well. And we're just gonna, Get that loose, there we go. Now with that loose, I can turn the, the, the tapered washers and introduce a wobble. So let me just tighten that up and let's take a look at how this thing now is moving. Uh, before we go any further, let, let's talk about this arbor. Um, when these are new, they come with a very fat spacer that may or may not be used depending on your application. And you can see that we've got a hex nut and there's also a keyway that's cut into that arbor. <laughs> and then we have a tongued washer that fits down that keyway. We also have two cupped washers these cups are designed to face the blade or face the stack of dado blades. Um, depending upon your machine, depending upon your lower saw guard, you may or may not need that spacer in place. Of course, that spacer does take up some space. That's why it's called a spacer. So I have this adjusted out to its extremes. It's tight now. Everything is in place. 
Uh, I'm going to turn this thing on, and this is scary as heck, just so you know. I'm going to stand way over here, and then we'll go at a slow speed. Ready? Can you see why they call it a drunken saw blade? Now, the interesting thing about this is it's not wobbling at all. If we pick a tooth, in fact, the tooth, I just unplugged it, by the way. If we pick the tooth that is the furthest to the right, in my case, that tooth will always remain the furthest tooth from the right. You can see it's way over here. So it's going to cut the right side of my dado or rabbit while the tooth that's way over on this side is going to be cutting the left side of my rabbit. So even though the blade is not sweeping back and forth, if you take any flat blade and tilt it, it's going to have the effect in the cut of sweeping. So the bottom of your dado, the bottom of your groove will have a bit of a concave shape to it. Now, what Vermont America did that was kind of clever is they took this thing and they set it at its furthest setting, which I believe is 13 16, it is 13 16 And they took the tooth that would then be the furthest off to the side and they ground that, if you can see it, at a bevel. And then if we find the opposite tooth over here, that one's ground in the opposite direction so that this blade is at its greatest opening, and maybe it's at three quarters of an inch, it's getting us relatively close to a flat bottom. The problem is, on the smaller dimensions, now you have a couple teeth that are uh, basically like an alternating bevel. So even though some of these are flat, some of these are angled, and we don't get a perfectly flat bottom. Now that's fine for joinery that's hidden. If you're installing a shelf, and you're putting a face frame or you do a stop dado and the dado is not seen from the front, not a problem. But do box joints, finger joints, and things like that, it's not perfect. So let's install the Magna dado. First, we'll put the arbor on. Hey, there's a gap there. Yes, I noticed that. I noticed that this arbor has in fact been ground off. I don't know why that is, but we're just gonna go with this for now. Take off the nut, the tongue washer, one of the cupped washers, and then we'll install this. Now there's a, a right way and a wrong way, obviously because the, the blades uh, teeth need to go in a certain direction, but also there's a hollow cavity right here, which is where your washer Guess what? That washer doesn't fit. So we're not gonna be using that washer. We'll be using the tongued washer and the nut. So this is a high speed steel blade. This is not a carbide tipped blade. This is a tight fit, isn't it? There we go. Let's plug it back in. I'm gonna stand to the side. Let's check this out. Oh boy. That's scary as heck, isn't it? We're going to take this off. I'm going to put the saw guard on, and let's see if this thing can even work with a saw guard. Got my doubts. Turn this by hand. Oh yeah, 
plenty of room. Lower that, tighten that guard up a bit. So now we need to consider our table insert. With the standard saw insert, which is made of aluminum, we've got about a quarter inch width. So we could cut a dado up to about a quarter inch width. But one of the problems with this is there's not much support for your stock. You tend to get a bit of tear out, especially when you're going across the grain, which by the way is called a dado. When we go with the grain, that's called a groove. When we cut on the edge of a board, that's called a rabbit. And if it's on the end or the edge, it's called a rabbit. Don't ask me why, it just is. So uh, you can see in this, I have a zero clearance plastic insert, which is designed for using uh, a saw blade. And this one even has accommodation for my upper saw guard. So I'm not gonna use this one for my dados. I use this one for through cuts, again, with the upper saw guard in place. This is a zero clearance insert, and you can see it's cast on there that it's not to be used with through cuts because you can't use an upper saw guard. But this is plastic. It is supposed to have a little bit of a bend to it. In fact, even your aluminum ones have a little bit of a bend to them. Uh, that's on purpose. Um, I have some zero clearance inserts that were made for a 500 model table saw, the, made out of plywood, made out of masonite. Uh, you certainly can make your own. It just takes quarter inch stock to do that. And then there are two inserts that are often confused for one another. This is a molder insert. And you can tell because it's shorter, this is the, the dado insert. But there have been very shallow dados that I've done using the molder insert because again, it gives me support closer to the edge of the stock but since the zero clearance inserts came along and since they are so easy to make, uh, I typically use a zero clearance insert for all my dados, rabbits, and grooves. And you might be asking yourself, why does that have a bit of a bow to it? Well, let me show you. In the case of the 510, 520, if I tighten that set screw down, that'll cause this front edge here to be slightly above the surface of the table. So now I can insert this screw and tighten it to the point where we are flush. Okay, if I go a little bit deeper, that's fine. But when you've got the 500 model table saw where that insert comes to an end, you wanna be sure that your stock doesn't run into the end of the insert running into the edge of the table. So in that case, I would wanna tighten my front one down till I'm roughly level and then bring the back one down and maybe even have it be a little bit high in the back. That was one of the improvements with the 510 was that the insert goes all the way off the back of the table, eliminating any snag there when sawing and dadoing. So I'm gonna bring the headstock over so I'm, I can disconnect my jointer for this operation. So bring the table down and we'll make some fine adjustments here with the location of the, uh, the headstock. In one of my earliest videos, I talked about the utility of these stop collars that are manufactured by Shopsmith. I use them all over the place, but one place that I think they're critical is here on the table tube at the very top. Whenever I am dadoing or molding, I just store it right here, and that way I have it. So when I am do using the dado blade or molding and the forces are being pushed down on the table, I've got something to support that table beyond the standard table lock. We want to do our five point safety check, make sure that we've got table tilted as we want it. Carriage is locked. Table height adjustment is locked. Headstock is locked. Quill is locked. Five point safety check done. Let's plug the Mark V in. I'm going to turn it on and then my vacuum. Up to magnadato speed.
So we got a fair amount of tear out. Again, considering it's a high speed steel blade, that's to be expected. But let's check out how flat the bottom is. It's not bad. If you eyeball across that, across the bottom, it looks pretty good. Let's do a groove going with the grain. For this, for this we use a push block. All right, so that's not too shabby, especially for a high-speed steel blade, a wobble blade at that. Um, I have some more things to show you about the Magna Dado and to talk a little bit more about some other things that we do with Dado blades on any table saw. Okay, so we're uh, 24 millimeters. 25.4 uh, is an inch, so we're just under an inch here. Uh, with the grain, looks great. Across the grain, eh, looks fine. Uh, if I'm going to put a face frame over this, not a problem at all. And I did that three-eighths of an inch deep cut in one pass. Could have done it in two. Um, so what questions, comments, cheap shots do you have about datoing and rabbiting and grooves with the Shopsmith Mark V? We're going to cover some more techniques and tips in the follow-up episode of Stumped Q&A. If you haven't been catching this, we do a follow-up that is live and public for a week. Then it becomes a private video that's available only to channel members um, how do you become a channel member? Thank you for asking. You can click the join button below the video or just go to the video description and watch another video where I describe exactly what's going on with the channel membership uh, for as little as three bucks a month. As somebody pointed out, gee, that's less than I spend on one woodworking magazine per month. Hey, that's right. <laughs> okay, I look forward to the follow-up and I have even more to share. Make it a great week.